Gandalf moved his chair to the bedside and took a good look at Frodo. The colour had come back to his face, and his eyes were clear and fully awake and aware. He was smiling, and there seemed to be little wrong with him. But to the wizard's eye there was a faint change. Just a hint, as it were, of transparency about him, and especially about the left hand that lay outside upon the coverlet. Still, that must be expected, said Gandalf to himself. He is not half through yet, and to what he will come in the end not even Elrond can foretell. Not to evil, I think. He may become like a glass filled with a clear light for eyes to see that can. You look splendid, he said aloud. I will risk a brief tale without consulting Elrond, but quite brief, mind you, and then you must sleep again. This is what happened, as far as I can gather. The riders made straight for you, as soon as you fled. They did not need the guidance of their horses any longer. You had become visible to them, being already on the threshold of their world. And also the ring drew them. Your friends sprang aside off the road, or they would have been ridden down. They knew that nothing could save you if the white horse could not. The riders were too swift to overtake, and too many to oppose. On foot, even Glorfindel and Aragorn together could not withstand all the nine at once. When the ring race swept by, your friends ran up behind. Close to the ford, there is a small hollow beside the road, masked by a few stunted trees. There they hastily kindled fire, for Glorfindel knew that a flood would come down if the riders tried to cross, and then he would have to deal with any that were left on his side of the river. The moment the flood appeared, he rushed out, followed by Aragorn and the others with flaming brands. Caught between fire and water, and seeing an elf lord revealed in his wrath, they were dismayed, and their horses were stricken with madness. Three were carried away by the first assault of the flood. The others were now hurled into the water by their horses and overwhelmed. And is that the end of the Black Riders? asked Frodo. No, said Gandalf. Their horses must have perished, and without them they are crippled. But the ring race themselves cannot be so easily destroyed. However, there is nothing more to fear from them at present. Your friends crossed after the flood had passed, and they found you lying on your face at the top of the bank, with a broken sword under you. The horse was standing guard beside you. You were pale and cold, and they fear that you are dead, or worse. Elrond's folk met them, carrying you slowly towards Rivendell. Who made the flood? asked Frodo. Elrond commanded it, answered Gandalf. The river of this valley is under his power, and it will rise in anger when he has great need to bar the ford. As soon as the captain of the Ringwraith rode into the water, the flood was released. If I may say so, I added a few touches of my own. You may not have noticed, but some of the waves took the form of great white horses with shining white riders, and there were many rolling and grinding boulders. For a moment I was afraid that we had let loose too fierce a wrath, and the flood would get out of hand and wash you all away. There is great vigor in the waters that come down from the snows of the Misty Mountains. Yes. It, it all comes back to me now, said Frodo. The tremendous roaring. I thought I was drowning, with my friends and enemies and all. But now we are safe. Gandalf looked quickly at Frodo, but he had shut his eyes. Yes, we are all safe for the present. Soon there will be feasting and merrymaking to celebrate the victory at the ford of Bruin, and, and you will all be there in places of honor. Splendid said Frodo. It is wonderful that Elrond and Glorfindel and such great lords, not to mention Strider, should take so much trouble and show me so much kindness. Well, there are many reasons why they should, said Gandalf, smiling. I am one good reason. The ring is another. You are the ring bearer, and you are the heir of Bilbo, the ring finder. Oh, dear Bilbo, said Frodo sleepily. I wonder where he is. I wish he was here, and could hear all about it. It would, it would have made him laugh. The cow jumped over the moon, and the poor old troll. With that, he fell fast asleep. Frodo was now safe in the last homely house, east of the sea. That house was, as Bilbo had long ago reported, a perfect house. Whether you like food, or sleep, or storytelling, or singing, or just sitting and thinking best, or a pleasant mixture of them all. Merely to be there was a cure for weariness, fear, and sadness. As the evening drew on, Frodo woke up again, 
and he found that he no longer felt in need of rest or sleep, but had a mind for food and drink, and probably for singing and storytelling afterwards. He got out of bed and discovered that his arm was already nearly as useful again as it ever had been. He found laid ready clean garments of green cloth that fitted him excellently. Looking in a mirror, he was startled to see a much thinner reflection of himself than he remembered. It looked remarkably like the young nephew of Bilbo who used to go tramping with his uncle in the Shire, but the eyes looked out at him thoughtfully. Yes, you have seen a thing or two since you last peeped out of a looking glass, he said in his reflection. But now for a merrymaking. He stretched out his arms and whistled a tune. At that moment, there was a knock on the door, and Sam came in. He ran to Frodo and took his left hand, awkwardly and shyly. He stroked it gently, and then he blushed and turned hastily away. Hello, Sam, said Frodo. It's warm, said Sam. But meaning your hand, Mr. Frodo. It has felt so cold through the long nights, but glory and trumpets, he cried, turning round again with shining eyes and dancing on the floor. It's fine to see you up and yourself again, sir. Gandalf asked me to come and see if you are ready to come down, and I thought he was joking. I am ready, said Frodo. Let's go and look for the rest of the party. I can take you to them, sir, said Sam. It's a big house, this, and very peculiar. Always a bit more to discover, and no knowing what you'll find round a corner. And elves, sir. Elves here and elves there. Some like kings, terrible and splendid, and some as merry as children. And the music and the singing, not that I have had the time or the heart for much listening since we got here, but I'm getting to know some of the ways of the place. I know what you've been doing, Sam, said Frodo, taking his arm. But you shall be merry tonight, and listen to your heart's content. Come on, guide me round the corners. Sam led him along several passages and down many steps, and out into a high garden above the steep bank of the river. He found his friend sitting in a porch on the side of the house looking east. Shadows had fallen in the valley below, but there was still a light on the faces of the mountains far above. The air was warm, the sound of running and falling water was loud, and the evening was filled with the faint scent of trees and flowers, as if summer still lingered in Elrond's gardens. Ha! Hooray! cried Pippin, springing up. Here is our noble cousin! Make way for Frodo! Lord of the Ring! Hush! said Gandalf from the shadows at the back of the porch. Evil things do not come into this valley, but all the same we should not name them. The Lord of the Rings is not Frodo, but the master of the Dark Tower of Mordor, whose power is again stretching out over the world. We are sitting in a fortress. Outside it is getting dark. Gandalf has been saying many cheerful things like that, said Pippin. He thinks I need keeping in order, but it seems impossible somehow to feel gloomy or depressed in this place. I feel I could sing, if I knew the right song for the occasion. <laughs> I feel like singing myself, laughed Frodo. Though at the moment I feel more like eating and drinking. Ha! That will soon be cured, said Pippin. You've shown your usual cunning in getting up just in time for a meal. More than a meal, a feast, said Merry. As soon as Gandalf reported you were recovered, the preparations began. He had hardly finished speaking when they were summoned to the hall by the ringing of many bells.